this episode of the Tennis IQ podcast. I'm Brian Lomax. And I'm Josh Berger. And in today's episode, we're going to be talking a little bit more about expectations um, and particularly how expectations and, partic- and certain players' expectations, um, both the, the expectations that they might have on themselves and also uh, expectations um, from fans or from um, the media in general uh, might, might impact a, a player. Um, and we'll also talk about this in relation to the French Open, which is starting right uh, on the same day that we're recording. Now, as we dive into this topic, um, I th- I'm going to go back to uh, a quote that we discussed last year um, during the French Open. We were talking about the success of Iga Swiatek and her embrace of sports psychology, um, which is you want to keep standards high and expectations low. Um, now, this quote, originally from Michaela Schifrin, um, is I, I think definitely important as as we discuss um, Iga Swiatek's um, her rise as a player last year uh, and you know her breakthrough at the French Open and uh, maybe some expectations that might be on her as a recent Grand Slam winner and the defending champion, um, but also as it relates to some of the other players, both on both on the women's side of the draw and also on the men's side of the draw and how the expectations that might be on um, certain players based on their past successes or based on um, certain challenges that they've had in the past, how that might impact both their performance and um, different pressure that they might be experiencing. I think um, it's a great quote to begin with, and we should start with Iga Sviantek, especially given that that's sort of the mantra that she and her sports psych have. Um, I often will lead with the expectations part only because I think we, most people or many people are very result oriented, right? So that to me, that's where the expectations come in, right? We're thinking more result first and, um, but what do we want to do? We want to be thinking more process and that's what the standards are on. So when we're talking about standards, people sometimes are like, well, what, what do you mean by that? we're really maintaining a high standard on the things that we can control. Um, so we're shifting in that, that quote from a result orientation to a more process oriented way of thinking. Um, so it will be a very interesting Josh to see if she can really live up to that. Uh, it's easy, I think to do probably in your first grand slam tournament like that, or your win, you got through it. Um, but she's been playing well lately. And so if anybody has a chance to do it, I think it's her, Uh, perhaps other players would be well served by adopting such a, a mantra into their game. Um, but I think it's, you know, it's it's a very interesting uh, perspective. It's one that I think both you and I use with our players to help them focus on the things that they can control. And so, um, yeah, I think it's a great approach to to trying to win your second Grand Slam title, where you are also the defending champion, also coming off a 6-0-6-0 win in the most recent big clay court event in Rome. So um, that in itself, perhaps, also brings some expectations. But like you said, there are other sources of expectations. And I think this is probably something that her sports psych professional is going to help her with is to not listen so much to what the media, especially, will be saying about um, how she should be playing in this tournament or if she, you know, quote unquote, should win this this event. Um, and that's, uh, you know, so that's going to be something I think that the two of them will be discussing a lot is how do we handle sort of the swirl of expectations that are going on around a player not necessarily coming from her, but almost being like foisted upon her. Um, but I think with a with a mantra like, you know, keeping your standards high and your expectations low and having had some practice at it, I would expect that she'll do okay. Yeah, I mean, to me, I, I think if, if anybody is well suited for um, the 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 high expectations of having won a grand slam. It's somebody like her, somebody that has spent a lot of time thinking about the mental side of things, um, who has really embraced the mental aspect of sport. Um, I was, Brian, I I was telling you 
we were talking about off air how I recently saw an Instagram live um, between Igor Sviantek and Michaela Schifrin, um, where they were talking about all sorts of things in terms of pressures um, that they're relating to and that, that they have in their sport, in terms of um, spending a lot of time on the road, um, just in terms of uh, talking about different cities that they like to go to. Um, I'm sure this is on YouTube. We could, we could certainly um, link to this. Uh, but, but yeah, I, I would say that she is, is well suited for the high uh, expectations or high pressure because she's put in the time, um, both on and off the court with her sports psych professional, and really has embraced the mindset of um, trying, to, um, tr- trying to master the sport, trying to uh, perform at a high level, trying, um, I've spoken openly about how important the mental side of the game and having a holistic approach to performance, um, how much of an impact that has had on her. So I think, uh, somebody like her, um, where, you know, the, her whole mentality is not about winning, 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 and being very outcome oriented. And, um, it it seems, you know, without being able to, to read her mind or having her on the show right now, it seems that her goal was not, okay, I want to win a grand slam. Um, because as, as we've talked about before, we might, we will probably dive a little bit deeper into right now. Um, when, when the goal is to win a grand slam and then you do what, what comes next? Does that lead to, um, does that lead to challenges? Can that lead to, um, a, a lack of, a lack of, of drive in terms of be staying motivated on your goals? Um, I know we talked about some of these themes in our recent episode on goal setting, um, and, and Dominic Team, who lost today in the first round um, and has recently you know, been very open about some of the challenges that he's had um, after um, having the goal for his whole life, his whole career, to win a Grand Slam, to be a Grand Slam champion, and having accomplished that at last year's U.S. Open, um, the, the challenges that he's faced in figuring out what comes next, in, in um, navigating life as a tennis player after reaching that milestone. So I think um, a player that has really embraced that philosophy of um, keeping, keeping her standards high and, you know, trying to do everything possible that is within her control in terms of, okay, her entire mentality, her, the, the whole piece off the, off the court. She's certainly somebody that makes sure that she does things that, that she enjoys off the court um, and also trains incredibly hard and, and has, um, you know, is certainly able to bounce back from things, um, on, on court with the ups and downs of, of tournaments, um, and of matches. Um, so yeah, I, I, I would definitely say that, um, her embrace of, of that mentality and of having high standards for all the different pieces of her performance will suit her well in this moment of, of higher pressures and higher expectations. It does seem that, you know, her perspective is one of trying to, you know, achieve mastery in the sport of tennis. It's a difficult sport to master, obviously, but it's, it's not so much about winning, like you said, a grand slam or, or whatever. It's more about she's exploring her ability to become the best tennis player that she can become. And again, that's a very, you know, that's bringing it back down to controllable things when we're, we're trying to do that. And so I think she's in a, in, in a good position for that. She has mentioned how working with her sports psych professional has actually made her smarter, made her more mature. Um, I think this is one reason I think you and I both advocate for players to work with someone on this aspect of their training because it introduces, it can introduce great perspectives for looking at different challenges or making sure you don't look at different things as threats can help you manage a lot of things. And I think it's by helping players with these different perspectives, it makes them look at things differently and, and in such a way that they can be more, um, you know, functionally adept at handling challenges and, and doing what's necessary. Um, and she clearly has that. She's mentioned how important that's been to her. And I'm sure that will only continue to improve. You mentioned Dominic Team, and we did talk about him in our goal setting episode, and perhaps being uh, an example for what you set as a goal um, 
is important. Perhaps the goal that he had set was not um, not a good good one. Um, if let's say that he had more of a, a mastery mindset, trying to become the best player that he can become, winning a Grand Slam is really just a milestone marker on that path where he actually made it almost like the end of the path. And then, like you said, okay, what's next? He's also mentioned he struggled a bit with the pandemic and and that piece, right? So it's never really one thing, but he does seem to be struggling to to figure out what is next for him. But I think there is a lesson to be learned there. Um, you know, what? how do we look at goals? Do we look at them as destinations or do we look at them as measures of progress on the way toward just simply becoming the best that we can become? I think that that would be a more uh, a healthier way. And I, if you're looking at the big three on the men's side, I think that's you, you see that. I don't think any one of those three really struggled with a repeat or a second grand slam um, when it came time. They, they, I don't think they lost motivation. So I would say that those top three guys, for sure, have had a mastery mindset um, to what they do. If, if anything, maybe this might sound bold or egotistical, but they probably all had some sort of, at least in Djokovic and Federer, for sure, um, wanting to become the best player in the history of the game. Right. And so um, that's also about chasing the best you can be in terms of that. Right. Because there's a lot to, lot to that needs to be achieved there. So um, I think, you know, with with team and you mentioned that he's already lost in the first round. Curious if expectations were a part of that or is it is it motivation? Is it a combination of those things? Um, not also playing in, in form recently. So, um, you know, we'd love to have him obviously come back because he's, he makes things more interesting and he has played very well at this event in the past. So to see him out in the first round, you know, potentially makes the, the tournament a little less interesting than, than it could be. Although I'm sure his side of the draw is quite happy. Yes. Yes. I think that's definitely true. Um, and I think it's, it's also relevant and there's been a lot of, um, talk about recently the, the disparity on the men's side between the, the top and bottom half of the draw where, um, one half has all of the big three, uh, Djokovic, Nadal and Federer and the other half has none of the big three, which I know hasn't, I don't know the exact date, but certainly hasn't happened for a long time. Um, and I think, uh, you know, we, we could talk about the dynamics of, of each half, but um, on the, the half of the team is on, it, it certainly it provides um, an opportunity for, for players to break through, whether we're talking about certain players that have achieved, um, you know, a, a lot of success, but haven't managed to win a, a major up to this point, such as Verev, such as Tsitsipas, um, or, or a younger player, perhaps, um, I know there's a, you know, a, a number of players like, like a Casper Rude, um, for instance, who have uh, achieved a lot of success on the clay, but um, maybe now, you know, in a grand slam with, uh, with all of the big three in a, the other side of the draw, you have that opportunity all of a sudden to break through and to, you know, win some matches and maybe gain some momentum. Um, we're on the other side of the draw, all of a sudden, um, you know, having that, that pressure and the expectations of an, on a Nadal and on a Djokovic that they might face each other before the, the, before a final, that they would face each other in the semifinals if they both got to that point. Um, and also, you know, I, even though Federer is obviously coming back from a long extended injury, um, certainly somebody that we can never count out. Um, I, I know he was speaking at a press conference recently um, and was saying, you know, he didn't expect, to to win uh, the French Open, it, it to me it actually seems like sort of a a milestone on his uh, recovery, um, where maybe he's a little bit more focused on uh, Wimbledon. Um, it, it, it seems, but uh, that he also said, and I, I like this, that he's he's not going to go out easy. He you know that nobody should be expecting you know him to roll over or an easy match. And I don't think I think I think everyone would be. Um, foolish to to assume you know a twenty time Grand Slam winner would would go out easy, but um, no, it, it's just interesting looking at the the two halves and 
you know, the half with team was already the, the weaker half, at least in terms of not having any of the big three and with him leaving that, that certainly creates a void and uh, it'll be interesting to see who steps up on that side of the draw. Yeah. And then on the women's side, you know, we, we've been talking about Igish Fiontek, but of course, when it, the, the, a big media story, every time she plays a grand slam is Serena and um, you know, the pressure of, of can she finally, gain this 24th title and uh um so there'll there'll be that and um again as always in the last few tournaments it's going to be very interesting to see how how she handles that how uh especially at a tournament not probably her favorite surface it's not like she can't be successful on this surface but i think um normally she's better on or more effective on faster surfaces um so I think that that's something to watch as well on the on the women's side. Um, there's also Ash Barty who's coming in with an injury. Um, that also has some uh, you know mental consequences. How much of a distraction can that be? And she pulled out of the the Italian Open in Rome with basically saying that her arm hurt too much, and uh, you know that's that that's pretty serious. So it will be interesting you know, to see how she handles that situation. And if she can keep herself healthy, she certainly has the game to play well on clay, the amount of variety that she has. Uh, so I think that, you know, on the women's side, there's some expectations for some of those players, but um, fairly wide open draw. I don't think that there's any real favorite per se. I think it could be very interesting, uh, especially in the second week to see who's left. A- absolutely. Um yeah, I mean, I, you'd, you'd have to put Sviantek as the the defending champion, and and you know her recent form as as one of the favorites. Um, it, even you know Ash Barty as well, dis, despite the injury. But yeah, it's definitely definitely more wide open. Um, I think it'll be a, it's a, cer- certainly interesting to watch who who rises to the occasion. Um, I think uh, you know a, an interesting storyline has been uh, Naomi Osaka's recent decision to. Uh, to, to not do media in, in throughout the tournament and her explanation of that. And then some of the pushback on that from, um, from the ITF and from, um, from the, the French, uh, Fed, the French tennis federation. Um, and, uh, yeah, I mean, it, to, to me, it seems like, you know, she made a statement that she wants to look after her mental health and doesn't, um, want to be, you know, doing press conferences and, and ask questions during, during this tournament. Um, I think it comes at an interesting time, you know, based on some of her, her results and maybe, um, things that, that she's going through. Um, but yeah, no, it's, it, it's, it's certainly been a big, a big storyline recently. And I, I think regardless of how she does, how well, or, um, how well she ends up doing in the tournament, I think will, will continue to be a, a big storyline. I, w- I would imagine. Yeah, and I can, I, you know, I feel some empathy for her. I think um, it is a tough ask, especially after a loss, to go in front of the press. And, um, you know, the press is not always kind to everybody or, or sometimes they're not always well informed with their questions. So I think um, in, in some ways, I wonder if the media could also take this as a call to be better, to improve a little bit. Um, but I do, I absolutely see where, where she's coming from. And um, perhaps, you know, we don't know if she works really with somebody who's a sports psych professional, but that would, could be an opportunity for someone to help her out with some of the things and how to reframe what's said in these press conferences so that they don't have so much of an effect on, on confidence or they don't insert doubts there. But 100% uh, understand where she's coming from. Um, press conferences you know uh, billy jean king came out and said well without the press you know we wouldn't necessarily we, you know women's tennis wouldn't be where it is today and that they courted the press and, and so forth but you know she was keeping an open mind on the whole thing but things have changed and i would think you would agree josh that um you know in the early 70s yeah you needed the press because they were basically gatekeepers to publicity but today there are many channels in which players can directly interact with people, whether that's through dif- different social media channels, um, whatever that is. 
um, you know, the internet and these social media channels have completely democratized, um, you know, access to the public. Um, so it isn't necessary necessary to always have to use the press to get out the word or interact with your with your fans. And I think, in fact, Gail Monfils at a tournament last year declined to do a press conference and announced that he was holding his own. Uh, I think it was on Twitch, some other social channel. And so it kind of put media members in the, a bind, whether well, should they go to the Gail Monfils press conference that he's hosting um, or not. So, but, you know, it's come down that uh, – the, the ITF is not going to um, be very open to her skipping. And they've, they've said that they, uh, if she continues to skip, that she'll, she could face certain um, code violations, which could affect uh, her participation in Roland Garros, and it could affect participation in, in future Grand Slam. So th- now let's see how she's going to handle that. Um, and uh, again, a tough situation. I think a lot of players are are sympathetic to what she's saying. They're not all necessarily agreeing, which, you know, it's it's great to hear different perspectives on this whole thing. Um, but I can also understand, you know, she's got to take care of herself. And I think that that's probably, that's definitely priority one when you're in a, in a, in a tournament. You can't be thinking press first, me second. So I get that. Um, however it works out, it works out. But, um, you know, I can see both sides of the equation on this one. Yeah. Yeah. I think I can as well. Um, I, I also feel, um, yeah, d- definitely sympathetic towards, um, her concerns about doing press and the, the impact that that may have on, on her mental health and maybe on some of the expectations or pressures that she, she might be experiencing. I mean, she's the, a player that has won four grand slams, but all, all on hard courts and hasn't had the type of success on clay or grass up to this point. Um, so maybe, being constantly asked about the differences in surface and, okay, can you break through and win your first um, Grand Slam on a non-hard court? Um, and also, I mean, she she has spoken out before about, about things and has really been a trailblazer on um, issues such as social justice last year at, at the U.S. Open. Um, more, I mean, in terms of speaking and also just in terms of, um, you know, having the different masks with uh, um, individuals' names on them. And, uh, you know, she has has spoken out very, very strongly in terms of social justice. And I think she has been, she, I think she sees herself as, as somebody who's an advocate and as somebody who challenges the status quo and wants to make positive change within the sport. And I, I certainly commend that. Um, and I also think that, you know, when somebody has a platform, um, they, might be more able or willing to take risks for what they, they tru- truly um, believe in. So I, I can certainly, I'm certainly um, in favor of that. Um, I also understand um, sort of the, the, the point that Billie Jean King is making that, um, you know, women's tennis is probably the, the most high profile women's sport or right up there with the most high profile women's sports largely due to the media attention that it receives. And I, you know, I I think, yes, there are certainly examples of um, situations where journalists haven't been as um, understanding or as sympathetic of what a player might be going through. Um, And we've talked about how, you know, right after a tough, tough loss, it's um, the the last thing a player would probably want to do is to be on the record about how they're feeling in that moment. And maybe you say the wrong thing or you trip over your words, say something regrettable. I mean, I've talked about how during my career, I wouldn't want to talk or talk to my parents or, you know, even talk about a match for the first hour or so afterwards. So to be on the record to international media right after a match that's probably really disappointing could, could, um, is undeniably incredibly difficult. So I I get that. Um, But I can also see that, you know, most journalists do a, a great job. Um, yes, there are instances of being asked very insensitive questions or them just not being as informed. I remember a situation where I believe it was Nicholas Mahout had lost a match and the, the journalist started the, the and maybe we can link to this. The journalist started the press conference with well done today. And he said, well, I, I lost. 
Um, so, so there are definitely instances like that, but you know, overall, overall, I, 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 I'm supportive of an athlete making a bold decision that might potentially impact impact them and have some neg- negative consequences um, based on what they truly believe in and trying to stand up for making a positive change within the sport. So I can I can certainly um, understand where she's coming from and you know hopefully regardless of how she does in this tournament and the potential consequences of her decision, hopefully it does lead to positive changes where hopefully um, this at least starts so starts that conversation of whether, you know, what, what should that relationship be between athletes and the media and what should an athlete have to, um, you know, stand and, and be, you know, questioned or um, critiqued by the media after, after a painful loss. I mean, I think that's cer- certainly something I've, you know, never, uh, I, I, neither of us have ever reached, reached that, that level and had that experience, but I can certainly imagine it being um, very challenging. So I, I certainly commend her for, for her stance. And I, I hope that this leads to a positive change as, as a whole. Yeah. Well, let's see, you know, how she reacts to what was uh, put out by the ITF today and, um, and, and go, go from there. I think another interesting player to talk about from an expectations perspective, Josh, is um, Stefanos Sissipas. He's had a great clay court season. He's part of that, you know, next gen um, group of players, and you know, Zverev and team were able to break through to a to a final in a you know different sort of U.S. Open, but but uh, Cicipas hasn't quite been able to do it. But he's he's had wins over Nadal on clay this spring. You know, except for Nadal, he's probably the guy coming in at the, at the top of his game and. It will be very interesting to see how he navigates his way through the the draw in Paris. He, today is um, the day we're recording, day one of the of the French Open, and CC Pass came through in straight sets today. You know, with a six one third set win, so he's uh, you know, off to a good start. But what are your thoughts on on the different pressures or expectations on a player like him? Yeah, yeah, I think that I think um, you know he's he's somebody that has sort of step-by-step raised his profile within the sport. I remember, um, I believe it was 2018, he won the next gen, um, the the next gen tournament um, in in Milan. And that was, you know, he was probably, I think ranked somewhere around 20 in the world at the time. Winning, Winning that was, you know, certainly a milestone. And then I remember he won in London, he won the, um, the year end championships, which was 2019. Um, And yeah, he's, he has beaten uh, Federer at the Australian Open in a in a very epic very um, you know very I, th- I believe it was a f- f- five setter um, in, a, in a match where both players were playing at an extremely high level um, recently um, took down Nadal on clay so uh, a player like that who as you know as very has all the different pieces to their game but hasn't broken through and managed to win a Grand Slam. Um, might be seeing this as a, I would imagine is seeing this as an opportunity where yes, the big three are on the other side of the draw. This is his chance, or this is an opportunity to, um, to get to a final without having to go through any of those guys. Um, and this, yeah, he, it, I, I think he's definitely well suited for a breakthrough um, based on, I know he's spent a lot of time training on the clay. He trains, um, you know, with at Patrick Mortogla's academy. Uh, he's he's said that clay is his favorite surface, and uh, his game is certainly well suited for it. Um, so yeah, I, I would say that he is definitely a player that's poised for a breakthrough. Um, a couple others that, that come to mind are somebody like an Alexander Zverev, who has probably had as outside of the big three has had probably more success than anybody at the, at the master's level, the level right below the grand slams. Um, but at the grand slams has, um, has had a tougher time compared to his success at the masters though. I will note has, has sort of step-by-step um, improved on that where first it was breaking through and making a, a quarter final for the first time. And then it was a semifinal. And then at last year's U S open um, with Nadal and Federer absent um, and Djokovic, 
getting defaulted. He he made the the final and you know was within a point of winning the final and, and w- winning the championship. So um, he's a, another player who um, certainly I, I have my eye on as a potential as a somebody that could could get through to the final as well with the big three all in, on the other side. Um, I, th- I think with with him it's it's interesting. You know he's had a lot going on off court as well. Um, to say the least, but, uh, you know, he, he, and, uh, as we're recording this, he lost his first two sets today and ended up coming back and winning the third, fourth and fifth sets to, to win that match. Um, and then we've talked about, uh, I briefly mentioned Casper Ruud. Um, I think Berrettini also is a, a player I have my eye on. Um, so yeah, I, I think there's, um, a lot of players that might see this as an opportunity to, um, break through maybe with, being further away from the big three in the draw. Um, and, you know, that might also lead to some additional expectations where, okay, maybe, maybe people are, maybe some of the people around them or maybe the media are saying, you know, this, you should make it to the finals, right? Or this is your opportunity to make it to the finals. Um, so th- those sorts of things can get in your head and you start to become very outcome focused rather than, focusing on that process of actually getting there. Like, okay, how can I, what, um, what is my playing style need to be over these next two weeks? How can I best look over, look after, um, my, my sleep and my, uh, daily habits over these next two weeks and, you know, the, the time leading up to it as well. So, um, thinking about that process of all those things within, within an athlete's control, it's ultimately going to lead them to, higher performances, but not thinking about, okay, I should, um, get to the final here. I should win this tournament, or this is a great chance to win this tournament, but instead, okay, how can I focus on everything in my control? It's going to give me a a great chance to perform well. And what that ends up meaning, does that mean I perform well? And the other guy in the court, the guy on the other side of the, of the net is having their best day ever. And I get blown off the court, even though I'm doing everything in my power, or does that mean, okay, I, I win three matches here? Or does that mean I win the whole tournament? Um, but regardless, that focus on um, having high standards of those controllable factors is ultimately what's going to give each player, regardless of their past successes, uh, the best possible chance. Yeah, so I think you know Zverev and Tsitsipas have a similar type of pressure or expectations around because they're part of that, that next gen. And then there's sort of the... The next next gen, which is yeah, maybe Casper Ruud and Yannick Sinner, um, players like that. Um, and if they end up doing well in this event, it's uh, it's likely that the further they go, perhaps the more and more expectations are created. And and, and how can they handle that? Because for sure, I think we're going to see somebody on that other side of the draw come through that we have not expected to come through. And um, you know, how does that player handle that? Initially, you know, in these first rounds, probably not that much pressure on them. Um, yeah, maybe they'll be favored in some matches or, or, or something, nothing that they haven't dealt with before. But, um, you know, the more that somebody's getting through to the quarters and the semis and not necessarily a big name, be interesting to see how those players handle that because they do have an opportunity, right? Whoever's on that other side of the draw has an opportunity to get to a Grand Slam final in which... In the past, um, with the big three, you almost always had to go through one of them to get to a final. And in this tournament, you don't. And even people like, you know, Vavrinka, who has won Grand Slams in the past, you know, his, his game isn't the same. So you don't really have to worry about going through him. Chilich, right? A lot of these, you know, these players, Del Potro, players who have actually broken through over the last 10 to 11 years with Grand Slam victories, they're also not really present. Um, or playing at their best, you know, to, to be yeah, at, at the level that they were playing when they were winning Grand Slam. So there's a real opportunity there, and it'd be very interesting to see how people navigate that that side of things. Um, maybe, Josh, we can wrap it up a little bit with just expectations in general, right, generically. what um, When you're working with a player, let's say um, – how do you handle that? How do you do you use keep expectations low and standards high? What are what are some other things that you would like to you know suggest that players look at? Yeah, I, I think that that quote is 
is definitely relevant um, wherever a player is on their journey that um, ultimately the the outcome is out of out of our controls but what we can what we can um, do every single day is get a little bit closer to where we want to be and we can um, form habits and uh, you know patterns in our behavior that can get us that one percent better each day um, and so I would say it's, it's partly that of, of this philosophy of trying to get one percent better and it's, it's partly trying to control the controllables, trying to really think about, okay, what in our life is controllable, both um, on the court and off the court, that we can truly impact. Um, and I, I think that's a big piece of it as well. Um, but when it, when it comes to expectations, I think, um, you know, it, it's important to, to really have a couple, an honest conversation in the beginning of a relationship about them. You know, what are some of the expectations that you place on yourself? What are some expectations that maybe you, your parents have on you or your coach? Um, and, you know, for a professional player, that's going to be a little bit different where maybe it's the media, maybe it's um, the, 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 national feder- ten- the National Tennis Federation for your country, um, where for, we, we, you know, maybe for a player who's ranked, um, going back to, uh, you know, the Grand Slam discussion, maybe if a player is ranked, let's say 75 to 100 in the world, they have certain expectations um, on winning a match or winning two matches to keep their ranking up or to improve their ranking so that they can stay in Grand Slam contention and they have more security of um, continuing their path as a professional tennis player in a little bit more of a secure way, not having to fight for paychecks on the um, challenger or future level as much, but able to keep playing Grand Slam tournaments, keep getting into main draws. Um, so that that sort of pressure and that sort of expectations that a player might have on themselves or their federation might have on them is also a factor. Um, but yeah, when, when working with players, I think it's you know important to just go back to, okay, what does your daily routine look like? What are those things that you can do every day to get you a little bit closer? And yes, we want to have goals. We want to um, you know, we want, we want to achieve things certainly, but as, as you've mentioned a number of times, Brian, those, those goals are not the end all be all. Those goals are milestones along the ultimate journey of us trying to, um, you know, to, to reach the highest possible level that we can reach. I think one of the other things I like to emphasize with expectations is that they can be very dangerous in a sport like tennis. Tennis is a sport in which you, you have to earn everything out there. So if we have some expectation of winning or some expectation of even playing well, um, then you start to lose sight of what's necessary to actually do out there. Um, You know, there's a great pre-match routine or pre-match interview that I like to show to to players with Roger Federer talking um, before the U.S. Open. and, And he talks about, you know, the match starts from zero. We'll see where it goes from there. And he said the challenge for every athlete is to be able to bring it every single day. And it's such a great message to hear, you know, one of the best players in the history of the game talk about the challenge being bringing it every single day. You know, really, you are given nothing. You can expect nothing. And so it, it really makes sense to try to manage expectations in such a way that you still know you have to go out there and earn every single thing that you're going to get. And so I think it's important to talk about that with players to, to let them know that the dangers of having expectations, because it can lead to other things. Um, you know, like the, to me, one of the most deadly things a tennis player can say is, you know, I should win this match. Um, you're really setting yourself up to, to have a tough day. You're also perhaps not being terribly respectful of your opponent because again you have to go out and earn it and um, nobody's going to give this to you uh, normally people generally don't just roll over for their opponents it's it's a fight out there so i think having discussions like that about expectations and um you know what purpose do they actually serve they don't really serve any purpose it's yep. natural i think to have some but how do we manage that process? Like anything in sort of the human experience, we're always going to have you know, a certain level of negativity or negative thoughts, but that doesn't mean you have to let them rule uh, how you behave. And so it's, it comes down to how do we manage some of those things? So that, and then, and then shifting to you know, expectations 
low, standards high. Is it that that gives you then something to really talk about? Because I could say, you know, potentially I could say, hey, I should win this match. That may be true. Maybe I should win this match. But I need a second half to that sentence. But I need to give my best effort. I need to play with a positive attitude. I need to do everything I can to to play my best out there, and, and we'll see how it goes. Um, but yeah, I I should win, or these expectations I, I find find to be rather dangerous. No, I, I I definitely agree. I think once once somebody starts using that word "should" or "I'm supposed to win," um, you you fall into and into that that trap of thinking it's going to be easy, and then. And then it usually standing. isn't. <laughs> exactly. exactly. And uh, no, I, I really like that you brought up that um, that quote by by Federer. Um, and I, I'll have to, to check out that that video of that of that press conference. To me, um, and I think it's it's you know we haven't really touched on the um, the, the elephant in the room, um, Rafael Nadal, who's who's won this this tournament only 13 times and has a hundred wins at the tournament compared to two losses going into, uh, going into this year. Um, and I, I think it's interesting to watch his press conferences and the, the way that he speaks about his opponents where he never takes anything for granted. Um, they'll, they'll ask him about a, a match and he'll say, you know, I expect it to be very difficult. Uh, I know that I'm going to need to play um, extremely well and fight hard for every point. If I'm going to have any chance to beat that opponent. And that's, that's truly, he truly embodies that philosophy. He's never, he never gets too ahead of himself um, talking about winning the tournament. He truly takes it one match at a time and really one point at a time. Um, truly to me embodies, you know, what it means to play one point at a time, which is you know that what we we've talked about recently um, in a recent episode. But uh, no, I, I think, um, you know, going, going back to that theme of, you know, you want to have high standards on yourself that, um, that that you're not thinking too far ahead. That you're not, um, you know, we we talk about some of these players in the next gen, like a Zverev, like a Tsitsipas, and when you're playing in your first round match, thinking about getting to the final or thinking about um, you know winning the tournament, then you're not doing everything that you can do to to um, to perform well. You're not aware of everything in front of you. You're not aware of the fact that, um, you know, that your opponent is, um, you know, trying out certain tactics that um, might have certain vulnerabilities. Maybe they're running around every, every backhand and they're leaving a certain side of the court wide open. Maybe they are vulnerable at the net. Maybe they, um, you know, maybe there's a certain time of the match where they're clearly emotionally flustered and you have an opportunity to maybe win a few free points. But if your mind is in, in the future, not, not present, um, not, you know, if you're not mindful of, of the moment and not aware of what's going on around you, because you're thinking about the future and thinking about your, um, your expectations of yourself of winning this tournament or getting to the final or, I should get to the final, then you're not aware of these opportunities that are right in front of you. So, um, no, I, I think, you know, I, I think another big piece of this is to try to, um, you know, be mindful of the moment and not get too far ahead of yourself in any particular moment, because then you run that risk of not capitalizing on that moment and not doing everything that you could do to give yourself the best possible chance to perform well. Arguably, Nadal's the most respectful player out there, especially when it comes to his opponents and uh, absolutely makes no excuses. I remember this press conference after beating team at the U S open in 2018. And, and uh, one of the people in the press conference asked him if, you know, he made a change to his strings or his rackets. And he had a really interesting answer to this. He's like, it's like, I'm not the guy who looks at the racket. I'm not the guy who looks at the string. I'm the guy who looks at the player. There are, there are no excuses. I had a bad set. I needed to pick up my level, and that's what I did. And, you know, he got himself going, you know. And that was a match against a team in the 2018 U.S. Open where he lost the first set 6-0, and he looked really bad. Yep. Um, and then managed to win it 7-6 in the fifth in a pretty epic, epic match. Um, but, again, everything he said about team in that press conference, super, super respectful. Um, and he even got to the point of um, – saying that it wasn't so much winning and losing 
that was most important to him. The most most important and personally satisfying feeling that he got was giving his all in a match and knowing that he did the best that he could. And he's just like, you know, sometimes you win, sometimes you lose, but that's that's what really drives my personal satisfaction. And he had mentioned, you know, a couple months before that he had lost to Del Potro at at, at Wimbledon uh, in, in a long, long match, and um, he's like, you know, that I lost a tough match, and but I still felt good. I felt good about where I was, you know. And so I think the more, yeah, we obviously talk about him as sort of a paragon of mental toughness, but there's just so many facets to the guy. Um, you could say, you know, he certainly got incredible strengths as a player, but he might not be like the most talented of the, the top three. He's probably the the one who has to work the hardest, I would think, of the top three. And he's just made that such a such a staple of his game that it's it's tough not to admire what he does out there. It's true. It's true. And I think it'll be interesting um as as we as we watch this tournament over the next two weeks. Um, uh, to, to see uh, how somebody with the expectations of, of winning the tournament and every year it seems to be, you know, he's, he's the favorite for good reason. And he has more expectations than, than anybody on him um, in terms of the media and in terms of the fans and how he handles that with such poise and with such humility um, is, is, yeah, I, I would say is one of the reasons why he's had such success. Um, and yeah, I think it'll be interesting to, to watch how he responds to that, um, yet again, uh, we talked about last year, how, um, you know, just his level throughout the tournament with, uh, his win over Djokovic in the final straight set win over Djokovic in the final as a, um, definitely a prime example of that. But yeah, I think, uh, I think he certainly embodies that, that philosophy of um, keeping standards high, expectations low. And I know um, Iga Sviantek, um view, views him as, as an idol, as, as somebody that she certainly looks up to. Um, I saw a picture recently of the two of them um, meeting um, and, and interacting. Um, so no, I, I think for, for both of those champions who, who won last year's tournament, I think it'll be interesting with those expectations on them um, in different ways, one has won the tournament 13 times, one has won it once. Um, and I think it'll be interesting to see how each of them uh, handle that and you know wh- whether they're able to rise to the challenge. And I'll add that rising to the challenge might not just be based on the outcome, but on that process of how they get there. Of you know, uh, Athletes are generally judged based on just outcomes. Um, but can you, can we start to get to that point where we are respecting athletes and judging them also based on, okay, are they doing everything? You know, how, what is that? What does their process look like? Are they doing the little things right? Are they taking care of their bodies? Are they taking care of their minds? Are they thoughtful um, in court on, in terms of how they play each point? Um, and I, I think with, with each of those champions, they are um, definitely prime examples of, focusing on that process and the benefits of focusing on that process and how that can really lead to being a champion. Yeah. I think it brings us full circle because the, yeah, the two defending champions are probably the ones who follow that philosophy as well as anybody. And so, you know, um, would we be surprised if they both defend? No, I don't think so. So great conversation, Josh. So uh, I appreciate the opportunity to talk about yeah, these different pressures that these pro players feel when they're playing playing Grand Slam tournaments. So for more on today's show, please check out the show notes. If you have any feedback or questions for me and Josh, please email us at tennisiqpodcast at gmail.com. You can also use the Twitter hashtag tennisiq. Additionally, please subscribe to the show on your podcast platform of choice, including YouTube, so you can be notified of new episodes. We are also posting new episode notifications to Instagram. Thanks again for listening, and we will speak to you soon in our next episode.